Let's go back to 1 Peter chapter 1 together. And let me just read again for you before we pray and ask for God's help as we study this passage, the passages, uh, the verses here uh, that I want to turn your attention to. 1 Peter chapter 1, and I just want to read verses 14 to 16. This is a passage that, uh, truthfully, I taught a a long time ago, a couple months ago, actually, and it's one of those ones that you kind of just have sit on you for a little while. And so this one has been kind of hanging around with me, and so I wanted to think about it again with you this evening. First Peter uh, chapter 1, starting in verse 14. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Father in heaven, we pray tonight that as we think about uh, these three verses before us, Lord, that you would indeed change us and help us to strive for holiness. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. Some of my earliest memories of, of being in school goes back to second grade. And I remember being in second grade and I was always corrected for improper use of grammar. Uh, you can imagine uh, a, a second grader, one of the questions that he asked all the time is this one question, can I go to the bathroom? And of course, if you were in the same predicament as me, you would know that the response from the teacher was, it's not can I, it's may I. And I remember in my little wretched heart, uh, thinking to myself, listen, we can either, we can either go right here, (laughs) or we can go where I'm supposed to go. (laughs) Kind of the ball's in your court, but. I just remember my teacher, she, she stressed constantly the proper use of grammar. Now I say that as, as sort of a, a funny way to kind of get into an important topic. Uh, grammar really does matter, especially when we consider uh, what many people have called the grammar of the gospel. The grammar of the gospel. Sinclair Ferguson says this, he says, there's a kind of grammar that we need to learn in order to live out as well as articulate the gospel coherently. This gospel grammar employed in the New Testament and coming to expression in our lives always operates according to a basic rule. Divine indicatives, that is statements about what God has done, is doing, or will do, logically proceed and ground divine imperatives, statements about what we're to do in response. He says this is true no no matter the actual order in which the indicative and imperative statements appear in any given passage. Who God is, what God has done, is, is doing, and will do for us provides the foundation for our response of faith in obedience. The gospel of grace affects our faithfulness. Now the reason this is important is that I think as we think about commands like we see here in 1 Peter, we can easily relapse into bad grammar. Just like it's easy to say can I instead of may I, it's easy for us uh, to fall into two errors that come about as a response to bad gospel grammar. The first error that we often see is the error of legalism where we make our obedience to God's commands the the basis of our standing before him. Where instead of, of resting in God's free grace and the offer of salvation that comes through Jesus, we actually think that somehow it's our, our holiness that gains our acceptance before God. And on the flip side of that, but equally dangerous, we can fall into the area, the, the error, excuse me, of what is commonly called antinomianism. We say for some reason within our hearts, well, I'm forgiven, and since, and since my obedience has no bearing on my, my standing with God, well then, what good is the law of God? It really doesn't matter anymore because we're, after all, right, we're, we're under grace. 
And so we miss the balance, actually, when we begin to believe that. The balance that Thomas Watson said when he said, the law of God brings us to Christ because we find ourselves condemned by it. And Christ, who bears the guilt of the law for us, brings us back to the law to direct our obedience to him. Both of these things have a a profound effect on our lives as Christians because if we think about it, if we fall into one of those two errors, we fall into either one blurring the line between our justification and our sanctification or the other which, which relishes the, our doctrine, or the doctrine of justification, but sees no need for sanctification. And I say all that because if we fall into these errors, it will cause us to misunderstand the call to holiness that Peter gives us here in 1 Peter chapter 1, 14 to 16. Before we begin to look at this, I actually want you to see how Peter lays out for us this this gospel grammar in the whole passage that we read earlier. You notice that these verses come to us really in, in a set of imperatives. Just look with me starting from verse 13. Peter calls us to set our hope fully on the grace of God, to be holy in all our conduct, to conduct ourselves with fear, even go a little bit further. And you see, he calls us to love one another earnestly. Yet why does he do that? Well, he says, you're to set your hope fully on the grace of God because you've been born again to this living hope. You're to be holy in all your conduct, why? Because you've been born into the family of God. This is the fruit of your adoption. The fruit of the the new birth that is given to you. You're to conduct yourselves with fear because you call on God as Father. You've been brought into his family and the list could go on and on and on. But you see this, all of these commands that Peter gives here in this opening section are based in this, that you have been made, if you are in Christ, part of the family of God. And in this very opening section, Peter says, if you wanna know how the family of God is supposed to live, how how they look in the world, well, here in 1 Peter 1, 14 to 16, he says, we're to be holy as our Father is holy. We're to be holy as our Father is holy. And so tonight, I want us just to think about from 1 Peter the topic of holiness. And I want us to think about it under three headings. I want to think about the nature of holiness. I want us to think about number two, the fight for holiness. And then number three, the hope for holiness. The nature of holiness, the fight for holiness, and the hope for holiness. So let's start by thinking about the nature of holiness as as Peter discloses it here. I know when we think about this word holiness, we we sort of throw it around a lot. It's 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 a word that we often use, especially if we read certain literature. But the question really is, what is holiness? After all, Peter says that here, this is what the church is called to be. We're called to be holy. I would imagine that if uh, I was to go around the room and to ask different people, even from different age groups, how would you define holiness? We would get a, a significant amount of different answers. For some, they might define holiness by what they think holiness looks like. They could list a, a bunch of things that, that we don't do as Christians, or at least they think we're not supposed to do as Christians. Other groups who maybe have been in the church for a while might give the the definition of, well, holiness means that we're set apart for something. And, And there's a part of that that is absolutely true. We think about the Old Testament, how the priests were declared holy, that they were set apart for a particular purpose. Or we might think about how certain instruments within the sacrificial system was set apart for holiness, or they were holy because they were used for a particular purpose. We might even ask maybe a younger generation, what do you think holiness is? And and, and they may respond, well, holiness is kind of an outdated word. 
right? Our grandparents talked about it, but, but what, we, what we want is just a, a relationship. And so holiness in, in that respect sort of just kind of goes out the window. But we must realize here that no matter who we are and how we answer the question, if, if we desire to serve the Lord Jesus, holiness is important. As we think about it, I have to admit that I'm, I'm really influenced by Sinclair Ferguson here in understanding holiness. He makes the case that when we see holiness, especially here in 1 Peter, that at its core, holiness means devotion. Holiness, it starts in, in devotion to God. It's not some type of, of dry mechanical devotion, but, but a loving devotion, a, a devotion that springs from an awe of the God who saves us and who, uh, who, who leads us in our love for him. That's why it's important that when we understand holiness, we don't merely see holiness as, as just being set apart from something. As if it means that we can't do this or that or whatever this or that is. But fundamentally, holiness is actually being devoted to something at its core or, or being devoted to someone. You think about this, this, this makes sense because as Christians, I, I just don't think we should be identified fundamentally by what we can't do but we should be fundamentally identified by who our God is. You see, that's, that's exactly what Peter says here. Peter says this explicitly when he says, as he who called you is holy, you shall be holy in all your conduct. For I, the Lord, am holy. Right, the, the basis of our holiness the standard of our holiness is God himself. You think about how, how high of a, a calling that is. Uh, we talked this morning a little bit about who the God that we worship really is. Think about what we discussed. We said the God we serve is, is perfect in all his ways. He's, he's righteous in, in all the ways that he deals with us and the world. He's just, he's fair, he's true, his love is perfect. His grace is immeasurable. Actually, the, the beauty of all his attributes emerge from him in holiness so that they show his perfection. We even think about holiness in, in such a way as it pertains to the Trinity. That, that before creation ever was, each of the persons of the Trinity were in perfect, pure devotion to one another. And so to be holy as he is holy is to live in loving devotion to God as God is in devo devotion to himself. Edmund Clowney says this, he says, our God is the living God. He is holy and holy in the high mystery of his deity, holy in the perfection of his righteousness, and because he is holy, we too must be holy, for we are his people. You know, here's, here's why all of this theology is, is so important. Because when we think about what it means to be his people, it means that for those of us who, who call him, who have the privilege to call him father, to say that we are his children, holiness means simply bearing the family resemblance. In fact, to be holy as he is holy for us really looks like being like Jesus. You think about who Jesus is as the eternal son of God who existed in that, that perfect, loving devotion with the Father and the Spirit. What does he do? He comes and takes on human flesh to show us what living in holy devotion to God looks like. We could say that the whole of Jesus' life was pure holiness. 
He loved God with all of his heart, with all of his soul, with all of his mind, with all of his strength. He, he spent the whole of his life devoted to loving his neighbor as himself. He, he showed us holiness in a, in a tangible way. You read how Jesus demonstrated this. He showed compassion on sinners. He showed mercy to those who fell. He committed his way to the Father, even to the point of death on our behalf. The epitome, actually, of his devotion when he was on the cross, showing us what really love of God and love of neighbor looked like, where it was most intimately displayed, Right, we're, we're in pure devotion to his Father. He subjects himself to the will of the Father and in love for us, he lays down his life for our sins. That is the epitome of holy devotion. Holiness in the way of Jesus then offers itself up to God as, as a living sacrifice of pure devotion. Now, that doesn't mean that holiness in this life is not a struggle. In fact, this is where number two comes in. We have a fight for holiness. We might even say that holiness is not only devotion to God, but it's the struggle for or, or the pursuit of a deeper devotion to God. You see what Peter says in verse 14. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. That in, in summary, in essence, is the struggle or the fight for holiness in a nutshell. Lay, laying aside daily the sin that, that easily entangles our hearts and, and seeking to pursue the Lord Jesus and who he is. I was reading actually today J.C. Ryle in his, actually his book on this very topic. And he essentially says that there are thousands of men and women within the church today. They're registered in the record books of the church. They identify as Christians as they live life. They're married in Christian services. They're planned to be buried as Christians when they die. But in their day-to-day -day life, he says this. Listen to this. He says, you never see any fight in their religion. He says, of spiritual strife, exertion, conflict, self-denial, talking about conflict with the flesh, and watching and warring, they know nothing at all. Such a Christianity, he says, may satisfy man, but it's certainly not the Christianity of the Bible. It's not the religion that Jesus founded. It's not the religion, he says, that produces real and true holiness for true Christianity is a fight. If we desire to be holy, we have to fight for holiness. I wonder if you've ever been around some older saints where you ever been around these people that have been walking with Jesus for just a long time and, and you sit around them, you talk with them, and, and you leave from them just more in love with Jesus? We often think of people like that, those very saints, as those who are so devoted to God. They show us what holiness looks like. And do you know that when you ask them, they see themselves as the worst of sinners? I can count the number of times that I've heard older men who I respect say, you know, the, the things that we battle change, but the battle doesn't change. We continue to fight for as, as, as long as, as we live by, by pursuing holiness, by really pursuing Jesus. No matter what age you are, holiness is a fight from conversion to glory. But I want you to see that it is a fight that is done in the hope of the gospel. And that's just point number three, the hope for holiness. And here's simply where, where I wanna end as we conclude thinking about this. When I read this passage, I can't help but think about the person who wrote it. Think about Peter. Think about his story. Peter's story actually gives us hope that holiness is possible. 
This man had made so many mistakes in his life, if you think about it. The greatest being the one where he, he denied our Lord three times. We have this, this, this children's book that we read to our kids. It, uh, it sort of chronicles Peter's denial of Jesus. And throughout the story, the, the refrain builds so that it kind of grabs the attention of, of a child. And, and over and over again, the people say to Peter, they say, hey, weren't you one of those guys that were with Jesus? And, and Peter constantly goes, no, I don't know Jesus. Over and over again, that theme builds until with almost a ton, actually it's with a ton of exclamation marks in the page. He goes, finally, no, I, I don't know Jesus. And if you read the book, it's right at that moment that the guy who wrote it, he says, Jesus looked at Peter and he said, oh no, because he knew he had let Jesus down. Now we realize he's taken a little poetic license there. But you stop right there and think about that. Some of us probably feel that way. Like you're a sore disappointment to Jesus. That your holiness kinda is always on hard times. And you feel like you're a poor example of, the child, of a child of God. One of the things that I love about that little storybook that we read to our kids is that you turn the page after the, the author says, Peter was sad because he had let Jesus down. And then you turn the page and it says, but Peter didn't stay sad because Jesus didn't stay dead. The cross and the empty tomb are the assurance that if you've trusted in Jesus, that you are never a sore disappointment to him. But you're a beloved child of the Father. Peter is your example here that no matter what you have done, there is always hope that you can walk in holiness before the Lord. We will always stumble and fall. We know that that is just the experience of practical Christianity. We know that this side of glory, holiness will never be complete, but the good news is that as we stumble and fall, we fall right into the arms of Jesus. The call to holiness, if you think about it, is not lessened by the grace of God, but it's actually strengthened by the grace of God. So that when Peter actually gives us this command and says, hey, listen, all of you, do you wanna know what being a Christian looks like? and he says you're to be holy as your father is holy, you can give an utter amen because of all that Jesus has done for you. So as obedient children, Peter says to us, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Let's pray and ask God's help for this. Father, uh, we thank you this evening for a passage like this. We thank you for the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that even when we feel like we are a disappointment, that we can know that because Jesus didn't stay dead, we are accepted in your sight. Oh Lord, we pray that as the, the outworking of your grace in our life, that we would pursue holiness to genuinely seek to be holy as you are holy. And we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen.